Okay, so um, we're going to talk about radical reactions. Uh, this goes pretty fast. Uh, what is a radical? <laughs> what is a radical in math? It's the square root, right? Or the square root side? Huh? Yeah, it's, it, it, generally we refer to, to a radical as something with an odd electron. So that means if you have like that, that would be an odd, that's how we would draw it. We would just draw a single dot to indicate that it's a radical because it's not a paired electron, okay? Um, or you might see it like this. And then the radical replaces some other substituent that's been like cleaved off of the molecule. So just really quickly, what we're going to be going over, and you can uh, follow, so you can go through the book and see uh, the sections. We're going to go over substitution reactions. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of substitution reactions, but these are uh, primarily uh, what's really novel in, in these substitution reactions is that we can do uh, reactions of alkanes. If you remember, uh, everything that we've done in terms of reactivity has been mostly done on things with functional groups, right? Alk alcohols, alkyl halides, alkenes. Well, one of the things that's nice about radicals, they allow us to modify, modify alkanes in predictable ways so that we can put a functional group on there. And once you have the functional group, then you can like, remember we did all the functional group transformations where you get, oh, there's a functional group over here. I want to move it over here. Well, once you get the functional group on the alkane, then you can move it around to different places, okay? Um, we will also talk about addition reactions. Um, if you remember, oh, and by the way, we will do uh, substitution reactions on uh, alkenes too, and that's this allylic substitution. And they do unpredictable things as well, or things that you wouldn't predict uh, until you've, like, covered it in lecture, really, or read it in a book. Uh, I may talk about antioxidants. They call it antioxidation. I may talk a little bit about antioxidants and how those work. And then we'll talk about addition reactions as well. So you remember addition reactions? You learned re addition reactions following Markovnikov's rule. So you take an alkene, and you react it with, like, HBr or Br2, and then you do an addition across the double bond. We're going to talk about doing anti-Markovnikov additions of HBr in the presence of peroxide, and we're going to go over that mechanism. Last semester, we just like learned, oh, just memorize this. This is what happens. This semester, we'll learn like why it happens. And then we'll talk at the end a little bit about polymerization. I've never really had a chance to work a lot of stuff about polymerization in my lecture notes, but that's an important topic, so you may at some future date have to dig a little bit more on your own. Just going to tell you that up front. Okay, so First thing, we know, what a free, we know what a radical is, or we often call them free radicals. So then the question is, how do we get a free radical? <clears throat> and the term that they use is homolytic bond cleavage. So what a homolytic bond cleavage is, is when a single bond, a covalent bond, is broken and one electron goes to one of the atoms on the bond and one of the electrons goes to the other atom in the bond. So what you're used to, at least up to this point, is what we call heterolytic cleavage. I always feel awkward saying cleavage in class. I don't know why. Sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have gone there. It wasn't awkward until I said it, right? Now it is. See how good that works? I've totally lost some of you guys now. Or girls. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm not... I'm not biasing. So what you're used to, sorry, is things like this, Na and maybe uh, Cl. And then when these two split apart, both the electrons go to the chlorine. That's an ionic bond, but you end up with something like this. Why do the electrons go with the chlorine? Electronegativity. It's the more electronegative of the two atoms. So it turns out... You can have homolytic cleavage. That's usually when the electronegativities are close. So basically, every carbon-carbon bond and carbon-hydrogen bond can be homolytically cleaved. 
And then heteroletic cleavage usually happens when you have big differences in electronegativity, like carbon and oxygen. Like when you cleave that bond, it's usually not homolytic. Okay. It can be. Depends on the conditions, but yeah. Questions? Hetero means both go the same. Yeah. Is it just like covalent versus an ionic bond? Kind of, yeah. So the, yeah, and the, the difference that you already know this, the difference is the electronegativity of two atoms. So you're just kind of fitting it into the language of organic chemistry. Yeah. All right, so, um, but like BR, BR2, when that bond cleaves, right, it's usually homolytic because it's a BR and a BR when it splits. Then you get two bromine free radicals. That turns out to be an important reaction because we'll use those to initiate radical reactions. Okay, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So one of the other things to recognize is the arrow itself is different. Um, they, they call these, I, I mentioned this last semester, you call them fish hooks. There's fish hooks here, this guy here. That's the fish hook, sorry. Oh, look, I drew it here, it didn't show up there. Nice. Oh, there it is. All right. <laughs> That's called a fish hook because it looks like a fish hook, right? And then uh, that's, the one, that's the one electron arrow. And then the two electron arrow is this guy right here. That's the one you're used to drawing in your mechanisms. OK. So, so let's uh, do a little bit of practice. Right? The top one is uh, what kind of cleavage is that? Homolytic. So when you draw the electron arrows, right? You're going to have an arrow go like this, an arrow go like that. Uh, that's pretty basic. That's what you end up. Those are chlorine free radicals. Uh, then, like I said, this is usually what we call one of the initiation steps. You form a free radical, and then free radicals tend to make more free radicals, and you'll see why in a little bit. Uh, what's the middle one? Yeah, hetero. So that means, in this case, which way do the electrons go? From the bond, right? to the chlorine like this. And that's a two-headed arrow. And what's this bottom one? It's kind of like a proton transfer. But in terms of radical reactions, it's, what? it's, a hydro, it's called the hydrogen abstraction reaction. What's happening is this. There's, you notice there's a, a hydrogen here. And like, where did it come from? It came from here. Okay. So in this particular reaction, you're going to add a hydrogen back in. Now, where was the covalent bond formed? Between the O and the H. So that means the electron arrow needs to start at the oxygen. And it's forming a covalent bond with the hydrogen, right? So this is a one electron movement. That means one electron goes like this. And that's going to make the covalent bond between the O and the H. One electron from each side. Now, what's that going to leave on, on this carbon? Oh, God, this thing doesn't work at all. Sorry. Yeah, it's going to leave an electron there. So you, but you have to show that. You can't just draw the one arrow and say, nah, I guess that's where it went. Hang on, let me finish the arrow, and then I'll take a question. Okay, so then you have to actually draw that like that. Yeah, but in this case, also, one of the things that you have to remember is radicals tend to form more radicals, so they tend to force the homolytic cleavage. So if you just have a bond and you break it, it tend, the electronegativity is the same, it's homolytic. But if you have a radical already present, it tends to force another radical to form. So would you draw the single bond and together? Yeah, just meeting together in space, and that's the bond, wherever it's convenient. Right, because clearly the bond is not that long. <laughs> I'm not going to draw like over here. Oh yeah, there's the H. And then you draw fish hook arrow on everything that's going on in the reaction. What's that? You draw fish arrow. Yeah, on everything, everywhere something's going on in the reaction. Okay. Um, we also have to uh, think a little bit about what is the structure because we're going to be getting into some stereochemistry. It turns out the answer is pretty easy, but we need to think about what is the structure of a radical. 
Well, you know what a carbocation is. Carbocation is sp2 and is planar. And a carbanion is sp3, so it's trigonal pyramidal. So what is a radical? Like if this carbon was a radical, right? Carbocation has a positive charge because it only has a complement of three electrons that it shared, right? Six divided by two. These are shared, so it's a positive charge. That's a carbocation. It's flat. It's sp2. And for carbanion, it's sp3 because it's got the four groups like this. And, and, and carbanions are weird, right? You remember what a carbanion can do? It can do an inversion. So it's got the pair of electrons in the orbital and can invert, so it's fairly rapidly interconverting, but it's a fairly large group, okay, as well, because it's two pairs of electrons. So free radical is somewhere in between, right? It's not going to have a charged, carb carbocation's positively charged because it lost electron, carbanion's negatively charged because so it picked up an electron. So a radical is in between, and it has one electron, okay? And really, you could think of it being like somewhere in between sp2 and sp3 hybridized. Now, the reason that's important is it's going to come down to, we're going to be talking about stability of radicals, okay? Carbocation stability goes how? What's the most stable carbocations? Tertiary or ones that have uh, aromaticity associated or uh, resonance associated with them, right? Okay, so, so those are the, turns out this could either behave like, if you think about it, could either behave like a carbanion or it could behave like a carbocation, and it behaves more like a carbocation. That is, stability is, tends to be favored by more highly substituted delocalization kind of situations, okay? So <clears throat> the most stable radical is a tertiary radical or one that is like benzylic is, is next to a benzene ring. Or allylic, remember we learned about all the allylic electron pushing patterns? Allylic radicals, benzylic radicals, tertiary radicals are all more stable. And then the least stable radicals are things like methyl radicals. Methyl radical is like the hardest radical to make, okay? Now, the trend for stability, okay, for carbocations or for radicals then looks like this. They don't have the formal charge, but they're still unstable because they're lacking the octet. So when they get any electron donation, that makes them happy. Right. I'm going to skip the hyperconjugation. Well, you know, we talked about that so much last semester. I almost don't want to talk about it again. But those, those bonds on the groups that are next to the atoms are donating electrons through their orbitals. If you've got more questions on hyperconjugation, we'll talk about it. You, you can ask me. I'll tell you later. It's the same as argument that I went over and over with last semester. Okay. Um, so, just to show you, um, bond association energies. Uh, most people just remember, oh, bond energies from Chem 1A. Remember bond energy? We talked about them last semester, too. Bond association energies are actually the energies required to form the free radicals when you break a bond. So, the bond association energy actually, oops, represents this process where one electron goes there and one electron goes there. It's actually the formation of the free radical when we say bond energies, okay? And we have tables of those things. And so for this one, it's the electron goes there and an electron goes there, and et cetera. It's exactly the same for all of them. And you look at the bond association energies and you look at methyl, versus a tertiary bond association energy. And what you notice is that the tertiary bond association is a lot easier. Right? The reason for that is because the radical is lower in energy. So if you're thinking like in terms of energy diagrams, energy diagrams where this is the reaction coordinate down here. All right, and they go, here's the reactant. Here's the intermediate, right? This is the bond association energy. It's the formation of the free radical. And since this is the most stable, this energy is the lowest. Oh, gosh, I forgot to do something. I learned a teaching technique. I don't learn teaching techniques very often, like teaching things, because most of the time they're not very 
useful. But people go to school for a long time to learn teaching things. But I shouldn't say that too loud. Some of you know, like, <laughs> I'm recording this, right? Like, I want to offend a bunch of people. So as I'm lecturing, I know that not everybody wants to ask a question. But I thought this was a great way to deal with it. We're going to do what's called the one-minute paper. Anybody heard of the one-minute paper? The one-minute essay? It's really like the two sentences that you wanted to ask in class. And it's called the muddiest point. Okay? You probably heard people talking about it because teachers learn. We all learned is that some. I, w I went and sat in a meeting for four or five hours, and that's what I heard. Oh, the muddiest point. That's great. Okay, can I leave now? No. Okay. So, um, but the muddiest point is you you write down that thing on a piece of paper that is the least clear to you during the lecture. So think about this as I'm going along. I don't understand that. Write something down. Okay. And then what you'll do is you'll I'll have a little box or something. You'll just throw them in the box, a little piece of paper. We can even, I can even hand you weighing paper or something when you come in. I don't care what it's written on. And then I'll go through at the end of every class, and I'll look to see what are the things that people really need to hear. And based on, like, if everybody does, doesn't understand this one point, then I'll go to that one point and explain that one point in the next lecture. Or I'll post something online, which I like to do because it's really easy. But not everybody reads what I post, so. No, 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 no. It's just like if you, if, if you didn't want to ask it during class because you thought, oh, it's not that important, but I really want to know, you could also ask me the stuff like um, something you really wanted to know that wasn't covered in class. Okay? How to make drugs? That's not on the list. <laughs> Better way to make meth? It's not on the list. Right? How, is, how, is this, how is this reaction used in the industry? Fair game. <laughs> Is this important in, in the formation, of the, the synthesis of new pheromones? Fair game. That one I'll ask my son, because that's what he's doing. But yeah. Yeah, my son James in grad school. No, he's the one at uh, Davis. The Ag, in, Ag and um, Environmental Chemistry program there. Yeah, which is weird, because I like, never really heard of the program. And then the guy that he's working for, down at the USDA, and the only reason I'm mentioning it is because you guys are all candidates for this kind of stuff. They offer lots of internships. So it's a great place to get a research internship. So if you're thinking about it and you want to know a contact down there, I'll tell you how to email that. Okay? That would be a summary. Internship. So that's kind of why I'm mentioning it. But then I was at a uh, food analysis lab. Uh, this is what we do on our breaks for fun. Um, and the guy says, oh, yeah, I graduated from that program like 30 years ago. I'm like, what? <laughs> Of course I knew that. I didn't know that. Yeah, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, it's not working again. Nice. Oh, there it goes. Oh, now it switched. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. <laughs> I'm all dizzy. Help me. Okay, so, um, so we also have to talk about, we're talking about electron movement and just some properties of uh, free radicals. What we need to do is address drawing resonance structures. Oh, yes. Resonance structure drawing will haunt you your whole life, so just get good at it. Okay? It's a little bit different for radicals. Um, if you are drawing resonance structures, let's say it looked like this, which was an allylic carbocation, right? It's pretty easy. You just draw the arrow like that, and that's the resonance structure for that. So hopefully you, you know, remember that pretty well or can review it. Now, when you have a radical, you can only move the one electron towards another electron. Okay? Turns out oftentimes there's three arrows that you have to draw instead of the one. Okay? So for this one down here, this allylic radical, what they're showing is... This is the radical arrow. Why does that one have to move to form the pi bond? Because it takes two electrons to form that pi bond. Uh, you could think of this whole thing as be co being conjugated. Okay? But you can't just leave the other electron hanging. He has to go to the atom, so he sweeps over, and he ends up over here. Okay? This is a pretty common thing to happen in radical reaction mechanisms is you get resonance structures. And the reason it's important, one, 
is because it shows stability, and that's how it forms. And the other one is products distribute according to where the radical shows up in the structure. So you have to follow, like, oh, where, does that, where did that electron go? Okay. So if I was doing an addition reaction, not that it matters, or substitution reaction on this radical, I could either have the substituent hanging off here, or I could have the substituent hanging off of here. In this case, it's symmetric, so it doesn't matter. It ends up being the same thing. But if the molecule is asymmetric, you get two different products. But you have to be able to follow where the radical is to figure out what that is. Yeah, and then if it was asymmetric and ended up doing that, it ends up being racemic because the free radical that's formed in the intermediate is essentially planar. Okay. Okay. So let's just practice. I thought I'd do one for you. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what is the, whoa, yeah, what does the hybrid look like? It's going to be like this. And a lot of times we'll put the dot in the middle because it's a distributed electron. Okay? Normally we put a positive or a negative. The negative implies the pair of electrons moves. Positive implies that the positive charge is moving or the pair of electrons is moving to distribute the positive charge. And a lot of times in a radical, they'll just put the positive charge like that. Okay. Yikes. Hey, where'd it go? There it is. Sorry. Um, radical stability. I don't know how I got onto that slide so fast. Okay, there we go. So let's practice on this one. So... Structure that's over to the right here, where I just made that little pen mark. Draw the original skeleton that you started with. What's different in this next structure? Pi bond, Pi bond right? Let's let's number these things. Actually, uh, let's go one, two, three, four, five, and six like that. So where is where's the new pi bond? Five and six, and the radical is on. Four. Okay. And then when you do the next resonance structure, you gotta push it again. Okay. Then what am I gonna do with that pi bond? I have to break it, right? So one electron goes towards and one electron goes away. It has to sit on an atom, because it can't just like in space, it doesn't have anything to do. Uh, I think they tell you not to cross bonds, but I'm gonna ha, I'm gonna do it twice. Ha! I'm so radical. Oh, man, I just had to get that in there, sorry. First bad joke of the year, but a bunch. My son Andrew made up a joke. It's kind of like this one, except for his is funny. His, his, joke, was, his joke was, why can't you hear the pterodactyl in the bathroom? Because the P is silent. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> he's he's six, and he thought, "Oh, that's great." He, he thought of that himself, I guess. I don't know. It's an old joke. You know, I didn't want to tell me he reinvented the wheel, but <laughs> like yeah, that's an old joke. Give up. Okay, and then there's one more structure, right? The one more structure, and then I'm going to cheat. By the way, guys, remember, I tell stories in class while you write. So the new bond is formed between, uh, oh, sorry, i got to move this. So we're going to go like this, and then this bond's going to break like that. Oops, I ran out of space. And then this one is going to go here. It's probably the least stable position for that almost, but... It's not quite. I'll tell you why uh, later in the semester why that's probably better. And so you'll end up with this. Got to do some erasing. Ooh, ooh, I got the wrong, pointing at the wrong thing there, like that. 
It's the same as the first one, except for the ring, the benzene ring, the positions are switched, but we know that that's a resonance structure. You could really stop there. You don't have to go, because you'd have to go through the whole cycle twice to get them back to exactly where they were, but it's, by resonance, I think it's good enough if you know that this has resonance form of that. Yeah, so that's really the last one. So there, it turns out benzylic radicals are really stable because it has all this ability to delocalize that electron. So if you actually list allylic, benzylic, tertiary, secondary, primary methyl uh, radicals, the list actually looks like this. Benzylic and allylic radicals are much, much more stable. So when you think about this, when you do a substitution reaction, that's usually where the reaction takes place. It usually takes place on that allylic or benzylic position. Benzylic and allylic are both stable? Yeah. And way more stable than the others. So when you have a double bond in a structure, right, the radical reaction usually takes place to either side of the double bond. Not on the double bond, but the allylic position. Also notice what I stuck on here. I animated it to make it like all exciting and everything. Uh, vinyl radicals, just like vinyl carbocations, vinyl, vinyl um, carbanions are all unstable. Okay. okay. So alkanes. Let's talk about alkanes. You're going to learn your first mechanism semester. Yay. I usually I think of this as uh, I, I think of this as uh, kind of what happens uh, when you go to Berkeley. Um, there's usually an initiation step, <laughs> and it forms a radical. And what the radicals do? Okay, think about the process. You form you bring somebody in. You have to initiate them. They become a rat. Sorry if you went to Berkeley, but I went to Santa Cruz. It's a love hate relationship between them. Actually, it's just like a hate relationship, but um, or was back then. So usually you come into this, a school, and they give you the whole initiation rah-rah speech, and then you become a radical. And once you become a radical, what do you try to do? You try to make more radicals, right? And then when all the radical reactions are done, this is the last and very sad step. Two radicals get together, and that's called termination, right? And <laughs> I, I've got a lot of analogies for that. It's not like death. I'm just talking about graduation. the graduation. They find some stability in life. And they're suddenly like a little bit more conservative with their money and a little bit more conservative <laughs> in their thoughts. So that's the termination step in the whole process. So not that they take them out in the street. Okay, so first of all, we're going to have in the initiation step, we're going to have a homolytic cleavage to form a free radical. That free radical then will cause the formation of other radicals. And it turns out in these alkane reactions, there's what's usually called the hydrogen abstraction. That's the removal of a hydrogen from the hydrocarbon. Okay, remember, we're dealing with alkanes, so it's pure hydrocarbon. And, and then what will happen is that radical will pull the halogen off of, uh, turns out, like HCl or HBr. We'll, we'll look at these processes. Termination, abstraction, yeah. So hydrogen and then halide. So let's go ahead and we'll look at these steps. And this is kind of all listed out as we go along. Um, <clears throat> first of all, this is what uh, initiators look like. This is the initiation process, okay? What do you notice about the bond, right? For example, chlorine can be an initiator, free radical um, reaction to, to make the initiator to start the reaction. What do you notice about the bond that gets broken between chlorine here and here and here and here, these bonds? It's all homolytic because the atoms are the same, right? So then these are the free radicals you get. Usually this is done with heat or with, it turns out you could do it also with light. So a lot of these are photolytically generated. That means we use a photon to, H, yeah, the HV stands for light, to, 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 Excite the electron and break, break the bond. Did you have a question? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And these are the energies associated with it. And we know peroxide bonds are relatively weak, so you can kind of see, like, oh, yeah, it's 
relatively strong, that's relatively weak. Okay. Why is this radical, by the way, easier to form than these radicals? Raised and then stabilized, yeah. Easier, because remember when you break a bond, just have to remember this, all bond cleavage reactions, doesn't matter what kind it is, those are always endothermic, always require energy. So if the product is more stable, the energy takes, it's less energy to form. Yeah, more stable is always the answer. Shelly Shelley missed out on her opportunity. I will deduct points from your overall score now. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so we're going to do um, show the initiation, propagation, and termination steps for the monochlorination of cyclohexane. Okay. So let me show you overall what the reaction is. I think this is with CLT. Let me just make sure you ask with CLT. Monochlorination of the overall reaction looks something like this. Cyclohexane, nomenclature, draw a hydrogen. You don't have to draw both of them. I understand. Sorry. And then Cl2. Monochlorination product. This is a... Sorry. Substitution reaction. So that's our overall reaction. So we're going to go over the mechanism now. Okay. First part is the initiation. So what is what, what is the initiation probably going to be? Splitting of the CLCL bond, right? So it initiation step looks something like this, what I've written up here at the top, right? You use light or heat. Sometimes you can add other things to initiate it too, but generally you just need to get it started, and once it's started, it just keeps going on its own. Okay? So you form this radical chloride, or chlorine, and then the chlorine attacks the hydrogen and then forces the carbon-hydrogen bond to split. Okay. Now, notice what happens, and we'll do some practice on other questions. I'm sorry. Come on. My pointer doesn't want to flip around. There we go. This thing's really slow. It's almost really fast. Okay. You're going to end up then the, this is the first step to form uh, in the propagation steps. You form a radical cyclohexane, and then the radical cyclohexane abstracts a chlorine from Cl2, okay? That's the abstraction. Abstract means just pull it out, right? Abstracts the chlorine from the Cl2, but to do that, you have to form a chlorine radical, right? So you form the chlorine radical. That's this guy over here. This is your product, right? Just in case you didn't recognize this dude down here. And this is the radical that's used in the very first step of the process. So that's why it's called the propagation step. You only have to make one of them in the course of the reaction, and that one just keeps prop going through the reactant and producing the product over and over and over again. Okay. Is there any radicals? Pretty much you get a product. And radicals are so unstable, they're like, hmm, there's another radical. They don't really care who it is. They just, and they're done. Yeah, so it's not like, not like an equilibrium where you think it's flowing back and forth like we normally think. Yeah. There's a definitely a distribution of products, but it's usually kinetically determined. <coughs> Like which products you end up with, it's usually determined about how fast it is and not how stable it is. Okay, so that, that CL is already there in the beginning? So this one, this one, uh -huh. is formed here. So this is that first step. Remember, it's the initiation, propagation, termination, right? So you have the initiation, you form the first radical. Once you get that radical, that radical reaction just takes off and runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. When do you think it stops? 
when they either they come together and they terminate, or they just run out of reactant, and then the only thing left is to terminate with some other radical. Okay, so when you do the termination, termination steps look like this one here, for example. You can get weird things in radical reactions. You're like, how'd that get there? And you have to work it out. But you can get weird things in radical reactions. Well, you can get weird things in all reactions, but radical reactions, they show up a lot. So this is a termination. These are one-sided arrows, fish hooks, that form a single bond, right? So any two dots can come together. So there's a whole mixture of products that you could end up with. But hopefully what happens is, right, you have your reactant, and you're running it and forming your product that you, you form a majority of their product before the termination steps. Right? So as long as there's a lot of cyclohexane around, the chlorine radical will tend to just react and form a lot of product. And then after this, like you would in any experiment, there's going to be a workup, and you have to separate a lot of junk out. Okay? And some of the termination steps also will form chlorine. Some of the termination steps will actually form your product. I'll ask you, like in the question, I'll have you draw the reaction mechanism and just draw a couple, because sometimes there's so many of them, just draw a couple of the termination products just so you show me that you know. Right? I don't care that you know what they all are. Or I might draw one and say, could this be a termination product of this reaction? And then you'd have to like run the mechanism, look at the resonance, and figure out where the, where the two things could combine. OK, so. Um, so that's the general reaction. So what we need to talk about a little bit is regio uh, selectivity and uh, stereo selectivity, or stereospecificity, is not much of an issue in these reactions, uh, other than they generally end up racemic. So remember, regio selectivity just means there's a preferred product. That is, when the abstraction process takes place, one point is preferred to be extracted from than another. Okay, and it turns out in in radical reactions, there's really two things that are going on. One is just straight statistics. If there's a lot of hydrogens of this type, there's going to be a lot, there could be a lot of product of that type. And the second thing is, how easy is it to form the radical? Okay. How easy is it to form the radical? This depends on really the stability of the intermediate. Okay. So basically, what people have done for every type of carbon-hydrogen situation, they've calculated the relative, uh, hang on, the relative probability of that kind of hydrogen being removed per hydrogen. And to figure out the total probability, you just figure out how many hydrogens of that type there are, and you multiply them. Okay. So I'll show you how this works out. It's a lot easier to do it than to explain it, OK? So let me just do one. OK, so <clears throat> um, let's just, for example, let's just take a look at this. Uh, I just want to do something real quick. There's CH2 and CH2 here, right? These are both secondary carbons. And the thing that determines radical stability is the degree of substitution. So these two carbons, when they form radicals, have about the same degree of have the same degree of substitution, have the same stability. Okay. So I have four of these kinds of hydrogens, and then I have these methyl hydrogens, right? And so there's six methyl hydrogens. There's three here, and there's three here. The degree of substitution on those is the same, right? You would expect, based on probability, straight probability, that it would be a 60-40 split in terms of substitution, just because there's six methyls, right, hydrogens, and four um, CH2 methylene uh, hydrogens. The actual distribution ends up being like this. So statistics tells us yeah, this should be more favored. What's making the distribution actually be this? Stability. stability. Okay, so stability plays a big role. Yeah, it's more stable. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, there's an inside joke. It's been running now for a year and a half. Okay, because they were all in my 1A and my 1B class and the first semester. The inside joke is the answer is always it's more stable. 
sun. Yeah. Yeah, or it's the sun. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Because we were talking about photosynthesis or something, and the answer is always the sun, right? Um, and we talked about entropy. The answer was the sun, too, by the way. Um, but it generally is true that the answer is that it's more stable. Your job is to figure out why is it more stable. Like, when you get a product, it's why is it more stable. Now, in this class, the thing that's tricky is sometimes it's kinetic. So it's not more stable. It's just faster. Okay? But anyways, that's where this... So anyways, yeah, surely, why do you have more of this? You know, if it was a kinetic thing, if it was all the same, this would be the distribution you expect, but this is what you get instead. Okay. So products are based on stability and the probability. And it turns out these are the relative rates for chlorination reactions. And I was it's important to dis make a distinction because this is just for Cl2 additions okay, or substitutions. Um, Tertiaries occur five times faster. Right? A stability of the radical, right? Five times faster because it's more stable relative to primaries. Okay? So primary radical formation, right, is five times slower than tertiary radical formation, and secondary is like 3.8. So if you want to do the calculation, this is one of those things I'll ask you to do on a test just to set it up of the distribution of products in a chlorination or bromination reaction, right? this is how you're going to do it. So this, let me go through the question. First of all, calculate the distribution for the monochlorination of this compound. Okay? That's not a radical. That's just a, like that little dot is a dot that showed up in between. So that's not a radical in between there. There's a single bond there, and it's somehow you can see it. Okay, I'll fix it. I just realized it now. Okay, what are the products that you can get out of here? So then, first of all, the first thing we want to do is uh, figure out what products are we talking about. Okay, so monochlorination products. And I'll draw it like this. I can do a substitution here. All right. That'll be the same as the substitution here. Make sense? Those are both methyl groups. It's also, though, the same as the substitution here or substitution here. All of those give you the same product. The other ones would be, for example, the CH in the middle of each one of these. That gives you, again, the same products, but different than the ones that I did in black. I don't know what color that is. Tan? Really? All right. I'm not asking you, really. Stop. And then there's these guys. That's red. I'm going to call this color autumn. I don't know what it is. Okay, shh. So I said, man, about they talk a lot. Right. Sorry. So this is how you do the calculation. How many, how many primary hydrogens are there that are the same? Primary hydrogens. Yeah, three, six, nine, twelve, right? So there's, there's twelve of... There's 12 of these. And then of the secondaries, I'm just going to do them in order. Four. And then of the tertiaries, two. In this beautiful autumn color. So now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the overall probability of each one. Okay, using these weights that are given down here for primary, secondary, and tertiary. And this is how you take that into account. Okay? There's the 12, 4, and the 2. Yeah, just uh, look at the slide, take a picture. Don't try to copy it all down right now. There's the 12 times 1. There's the 4 times 3.8. And then there's the 2 times 5. These are the overall, what you... 
overall weights for the three different kinds of carbons, right? Or three, three different kinds of hydrogens. And then to calculate the percentage of each product, all you do is you add these together, right? And then divide by the totals. And that actually gives you the probability, the distribution of products in a free radical reaction. Okay, so this is for chlorination. The numbers for bromination and for fluorination are different. Okay, but let me show you what. Um, oh, yeah, so there I wrote it out nice as answers like this. I actually drew the structures. Those are the structures. I'm going to skip over that part. Okay. So just really quickly, I want to review something. Um, and it's called Hammond's postulate. Oh, what time does class end? 120, right? Because it's a Monday, Wednesday yeah. class. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Sorry. So, um, so Hammond's postulate says, well, let's, let me test you. If this was the energy diagram, since it froze on me, if this is the energy, the arrow's not supposed to be there. If this is the energy diagram, does the transition state look more like the reactant or the intermediate in this case, or product in this case. Looks like the intermediate. Why is that? Yeah, Hammond's postulate says, whatever you're closest to energy to is what you look like. Okay? Kind of makes sense, right? When you think about what he said, that's really what he said. Sorry, I disconnected. I think it's still recording. It's still recording. Yeah, yeah. So that's the phrase, yeah, Hammond. Hammond was the scientist who came up with this idea. But it turns out it has a lot of application, OK? So if this is the reactant and this is the intermediate, the free radical intermediate, the energy difference between the reactant and the intermediate determines what this Intermediate determines what this energy looks like. Okay. On the other hand, it could be the other. So overall, in the in the energy diagram for free radical chlorination, there's this drop in the intermediate that's exothermic from about two to ten kcal's. Okay. Turns out if you try to do the one for methyl, it doesn't work out. Methyl is almost zero. But it's usually typically between 2 and 10 kcals per mole, which in kilojoules per mole is really like 8 to 12, you know, that kind of thing. It's a fairly significant drop in energy. So then it ends up being that the reactant looks like the, tra the transition state looks like the reactant. Product distribution doesn't care so much about stability of the radical. But when you do the same thing for bromination, Skip over that. Bromination looks like this. Oh, by the way, those are some of the calculations involved in making this slide. You can look at it. Notice what the, 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 the numbers are like. Tertiary is 1,600 times faster than primary. Okay. So that means if you have a tertiary, a, car, a hydrogen on a tertiary carbon, guess which product you get when you do bromination? You get the tertiary product, because that's the one that happens so much more faster. Okay? And that happens because, right, to the intermediate, it's usually about 10, or the, sorry, to the intermediate, it's 10 to 14 kcals, which means the transition state looks a lot like a radical. And because it looks like a radical, radical stability plays a big part in the distribution of products. Okay? So let's, let's think about this. Why, why is it good to know these things like in a sort of general sense. Let's say you have a hydrocarbon, right, that looks like this. And you want, right, the substitution to be on the primary carbon. What technique do you use? You use chlorination or fluorination because those are less yeah, fluorination, like I said, is supposed to be really dangerous. I've never done one, never seen one. They just say it blows up. So I'm like, eh, trust you. <laughs> but um, 
Although that's how they invented Teflon. Wait, what? That's how it was Teflon. It was a free radical fluorination of a hydrocarbon. And they, this was during World War II. And they had this steel vessel, and they put the fluorine and this big, because they knew it was very reactive. They ran the reaction. They opened it up, and there was this stuff stuck all inside the tube, and they couldn't get it out. Like, man, we can't get this out with anything. It's, can't, anything can't stick to it. So then they put it to the side and said, well, this is useless. And then later they realized, wait, nothing sticks to it. <laughs> hey, well, that's a great idea. <laughs> all right? It's one of those, they weren't trying to do that at the time, but after they did it, they're like, wow, this is a great idea. No, I don't know. I don't know why it's poisonous. I think it's better to cook with other things. Okay, so if you have this, right, and you want, and you want your primary sub, uh, substitution to over, be here, or you want a primary substitution, you won't use bromination, because if you use bromination, it'll all be over here. Right? On the other hand, if you want it in the secondary position, then you would choose bromination, do the radical reaction, and then that's where the Halogen would be, and once you have a halogen, an alkyl halide, you can make an alcohol, you can make a ketone, you can make a, you know, there's a lot, you can add carbons, you can do all kinds of stuff at that point. <sighs> Sorry, that was very exciting. Oh, wait, I got, I got to push the button here. Sorry. So this is what I was just saying. The reaction is endothermic to the intermediate. Transition state looks like... The radical, right? So radical stability is more important in bromination, least important in fluorination. The probabilities are almost like 1, 1, and 1 for fluorination. It doesn't care at all. Okay. The general principle is this, okay? More reactive, less selective. Fluorine is very reactive, tends to be less selective in where the hydrogens are pulled off. And more uh, sel um Less reactive will be more selective. Okay? So it's like you when you go to the refrigerator for a snack, right? Oh, I'm really hungry. Don't care what I eat. I eat anything. Right? Go to the refrigerator, kind of hungry, but you want to eat because you just took an OCHEM test or you're studying for one. And, and you look at the refrigerator and go, oh, I want that. I don't want to eat this other stuff. It doesn't make me happy. I'm going to eat bacon and shrimp or something. <laughs> I do a lot of stuff with bacon and shrimp and <laughs> mushrooms. And I have, yeah. Problem is, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not very selective. <laughs> I'm more reactive. <laughs> okay, just a general summary then. Chlorine, exothermic to the intermediate, very fast. Transition state, less radical character, not very selective. And then bromination, endothermic to the intermediate. It's much slower because it's endothermic. But then the transition state looks like the radical, and so it's relatively selective in its, in its choosing of the hydrogen. The weightings, like overall, look like this. So you can really see how the, the nature of the radical affects the distribution of products. And like I said, if you don't want the more substituted product, then you would do chlorination or fluorination. If you want the more substitution substituted product, then you would use bromination. Can you go back on the mm, I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> yes, I can. Yes, it is. Miracle of miracles. Oh, wait. Take a picture. Okay. <laughs> Stereochemistry, it's receiving. <laughs> Good. That's all I had on that. Oh, it doesn't even want, now it doesn't want, it, it wants to stay on this slide. Wait, go back. Okay. So, just to give you an example, we're going to do the hal bromination of this molecule, right? Product, what's it look like? It's bromination, so it's a substitution reaction. I'm going to replace the hydrogen. I need to look at the structure, right? Find the most substituted hydrogens. There's two positions that it could be substituted in, right? They will probably be equal, like 50% of each, plus if it's got a race mate, it'll be also split up as a, a racemic mixture, okay? So you could draw it like this.
Now, I, I, well, we'll just. I'm drawing with my finger because I put my pen down. <laughs> can you tell? All right. So it can be like this. Let's see, what do I have on that? Plus an enantiomer, right? And then, oh, you know what? I'll take that back. It's miso. Miso. Uh, Tricked me. You can still do the other one, right? Yeah, but it could still be the other one. And it has two methyl groups on it, so it's not chiral. Right? So sad. Miso means it has the plane of symmetry. Oh, okay. yeah, and so its mirror image is itself, basically. Yeah. So it would be something like this. Oh, my goodness. Man, fat finger and everything. Okay, let's go back. I don't know what it did there. Hang on. There you go. It could be that. <clears throat> this will just be the one enantiomer because you're not affecting the stereo center. Uh, this one uh, doesn't matter because it's meso. What's that? And just as a tertiary because. It's the, the relative rates of reaction is 1,600 to 1. All right. That's when you buy the lottery ticket. Sure. By the way, it's never that, so you don't buy a lottery ticket. Well, the second one, you wouldn't need a wedge. Uh, yeah, you pre really don't need a wedge for any of them. Yeah, actually, that's, that's, that's also uh, meso. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, ignore any comments about stereochemistry. There are no stereochemistry in either one of these. They're both meso. Thank you, George. All right, I believe I am out of time. So I don't want to start into the next mechanism, which is allylic. So that's where we'll pick up. We're about halfway through the chapter. We'll finish this in two days. Woohoo!